A reading from the second book of Samuel. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drank from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. If that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Ephesians. I, the prisoner of the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of calling to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, hearing one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, 
When he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean? But they had also descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descends, descended is the same one who ascended far above all the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who was the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. They say diplomacy is the art of the possible, and we've certainly seen some 
unexpectedly possible diplomacy lately of what the biggest uh, prisoner swap since the Cold War in the past week. But to look beyond diplomacy, I would really say that lived Christianity is the art of the possible, calling us to constantly be renegotiating what seem to be the bounds and boundaries of possible and impossible, or at least improbable. Christianity, the art of the possible, the surprising changes of perspective we may come to when we see the truth in the statement that in God all things are possible. In a way, just recently, I don't know about you, I've been, Victoria and I have been watching the Olympics with great interest and it's always amazing to see what some of these athletes are capable of doing, whatever, dancing on a, on a beam about four inches wide and doing things that you know, I'd never be able to do in a million years and yet doing it, doing it. But in a larger sense, sometimes you can see, uh, if you will, moments of redemption where someone who in an earlier time has failed, has, has missed the right step, has had to be removed from competition because of a condition that's overtaken them or something, are able to come back in another time, fulfill what they couldn't do before. Uh, moments of redemption, moments of release from the, the pain of, of a a less than good performance, of a less than good sharing of the self. But, but the, the unexpectedness of seeing it sometimes can point us again beyond ourselves, point us beyond our normal, quote, quote, expectations. I think of the uh, Episcopal theologian, the layman William Stringfellow, one of his favorite fun activities, especially in the summer, was the circles. He was a serious guy, a law degree from Harvard, he wrote a lot of books on theology. In the summer, he would go off. One time he joined the circus for you know a month or two to just follow him around. But he would marvel at the way uh, the bounds of the possible were renegotiated by them. Whatever, uh, you know, swinging on trapezes, walking on high wires, taming lions, death defying. And he said in a way the circus provided for him one of the, the truest outward signs of, of the resurrection possibility that reminds us that in life, in love, in Christ, even death is overcome, which to rational thought seems so improbable, impossible, and yet in Christ, there it is, there it is, a reminder that what we thought was impossible proves not to be. And of course, all of this takes place in the context of our gospel story, and I'm intentionally using the word story from both last week and this week. Uh, both of them set in the context of Jesus' miraculous feeding of the 5,000. And last week we heard, I would urge the first part of that story. So the Jesus and the disciples, they've gone out into the wilderness, out into a place with very low infrastructure, let's say, and out comes this multitude of people, and it's sort of like, how are we going to feed them? How are we going to feed them? Very practical, logistical concern. 5,000 people, not much food, a little bit, few barley loaves, a little bit of fish. That's not going to go very far, and yet uh, the logistics are overcome, and they are fed, but it's really about, so it's about food. It's about hungry people who do get fed. Make no mistake, this is not just talking in hypotheticals or abstractions. Hungry people get fed. And that's a ministry we continue to this day, where the church continues to feed hungry people, the gathering, and people gather and they get fed. But it's more than that. It's more than that. It's, it's the talk about bread, and, you know, the bread, what to do with the bread. And I just want to say, it is about real bread that has texture and taste and calories, but it's more than that. So that when we say the Lord's Prayer, our Father in Heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And by the way, it's an us, not a me. I'm not praying, give me my daily bread. It's give us our daily bread. That we're not just talking about, give us today our daily sandwich. We're not talking about, will this be, you know, oat or wheat or rye or barley. 
It's really what we need to live, what we need to live. Give us this day what we need to live, and ultimately not just what we need to get through this life and not starve to death or you know, die of exposure, but give us everything we need for fulfillment, for salvation. Give us this day our daily bread. And so in today's story, Jesus <laughs> looks a little skeptical at the crowds and how people are really out to find him and get him and be with him. It says, did you come because you ate your fill of bread? And he says, he's kind of like, look beyond that. I am the living bread. I am the living bread. In other words, the living source of the salvation that we need. Give us this bread. We, if we live, we will receive this bread and live always in him. Give us this bread. And you see, he's again renegotiating the, the possibilities of, of, of what can be done, what is achievable, what is knowable. So it's not just like it's hard and fast. Things that seemed impossible may prove to be indeed possible. That in life, in love, death is overcome. In Christ, death is overcome. And, and the circumstances that limit us, so we're not just talking life and death. Although I'll tell you, as somebody who spends a lot of my days working in a hospital, I've seen patients who are expected to die who did live. And I've seen patients who are expected to die in this much time live for this amount of time. So it's not just that the miracles are 2,000 years ago or in you know some kind of airy theological terms. I'm talking about real moments of grace. And beyond just life and death. I and mean, I can say in my own life, times when the, the door that I most needed was opening, when another was closing, or the, <laughs> the plan beyond me was well beyond what I ever would have conceived. And the best things that have happened to me were things that I neither planned nor asked for. Neither planned nor asked for, but there they were. And if the door opens, I will by God step through it. <laughs> I will. And so can you. I mean, just like this morning, we were talking about someone who was in you know, a difficult job situation, and suddenly, there it is. It's the new job opening. You don't have to do that junk anymore. There's a better way. There's a new possibility. Open the door, and I'll step through it. Open the door, and we'll step through it. Open the door for the bread that lives. Open the door for us. And, and that's about God's presence with us. If what seemed impossible or at least improbable proves indeed in so many cases to be there for us, there with us, God with us. I mean, what's the most improbable thing that the maker of heaven and earth and all of it is shows up in our life, makes a difference in us in what we can do and see and feel and be. And it's a reminder also of the preciousness of life. And one more way of looking at this this business of the bread that's really more than bread. In the story about the feeding of the 5,000, at the end of the story, amazingly, there's even leftovers. There's leftover. But we're not just talking about, you know, bits of leftover bread. Jesus says, gather up the fragments so that none of it may be wasted. And they gather them up. Um, many years ago, James DeCoven, uh, now commemorate with the Coven Center and Racine, probably one of the more significant uh, witnesses, let's say it that way, in the Episcopal Church in the 19th century, uh, fought for an approach to living Christianity that we now just pretty much take for granted to believe in Christ's presence in the sacrament. Again, it's bread, but it's more than bread. It still has taste and texture and calories, but it also can be, in certain consecrated circumstances, the body of Christ. And so he believed in that at a time when that wasn't always a popular perspective in the Episcopal Church, as well as other things we kind of take for granted. You know, Eucharistic vestments, altar candles, processional cross, festive choir, and he stood up for that. He stood up for that at general convention, but he did it in a way that took the argument, if you will, beyond just a zero-sum game of I win, you lose, or you win, I lose, to call for a perspective on the church as inclusive, as open, as welcoming of all kinds of people and ways of being. And that was really 
mapping a way forward that went beyond a particular churchmanship controversy into a way of being church. And it had, in a way, a lot to do with bread and how we <laughs> celebrate with it. But the Coven, near the end of his life, preached a sermon on this text about gathering up the fragments at the end of the feeding of the 5,000. And he talked not just about gathering up pieces of leftover bread, but about the pieces of lives that all of us, at one time or another, have our own fragments, moments of disappointment, moments of disconnection, moments where something didn't go the way it was expected. I was thinking, watching the Olympics again last night, that our uh, gold and bronze medal winners at the previous Olympics weren't having such a good experience and one had to withdraw, that's uh, Simone, had to withdraw uh, because of a condition that she had, had to withdraw from many events at least, she got one. And another uh, with us, uh, Jade, that's it, Jade, uh, last time had a stumble as she was approaching the vault and really went badly. This time she nailed it. They, they were even talking about their redemption tour, uh, just to say that we can be redeemed. Redeemed, for us, I'll say redeemed in Christ. That when de Coven looked at his life, near the end of his life, and he said, gather up the fragments. And he's not just talking about pieces of bread. He's talking about all the shards, all the incompletes, all the things that weren't quite what we were hoped to be, but that in Christ we find the fulfillment and that the puzzle pieces that didn't seem to fit come to fit and the possibilities that seemed improbable or impossible prove to be indeed possible, possible for us, possible in Christ, possible in the one who is the living bread that came down from heaven. Evermore give us this bread. Evermore help us to gather up the fragments and let us celebrate his life with us as we break the bread. In our prayers today, we remember the church around the world. We pray for the leadership of the Diocese of Wisconsin, including for Matthew, our bishop. We pray for the dean, the chapter, the staff, and the trustees of the Cathedral Corporation. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we remember the Anglican Church of Kenya. 
We remember the people and clergy of St. John's Cathedral and the people and clergy of our companion diocese of Nuala and Tanzania. We remember all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit, including those on our parish prayer list. Polly, Carol, Monique, Melissa, Michael, Jody, Sean, Gunnar, Ted, Noel, and fit Noel and family, Susan, Mariana, and John, Carol, Janine, Valerie, Pandre, Marianne, Beverly, Marcia, Anna, Melissa, Madeline, Tony, John, Rich, Crystal, Nicole, and Greg and Barb. We remember those who celebrate birthdays this week, Lawrence Swade, and those celebrating anniversaries, John and Bonnie Carpenter, Neil and Jane Radke, and Jamie Reynolds and Amy Hudson. And we remember those who have died. In peace and in faith, let us offer our prayers saying, Christ have mercy. For the church of God in every place that it may persevere in faith and hope, we pray to you. For Michael, our presiding bishop, for Sean, our presiding bishop-elect, and for all the people of God, let us pray. For peace and tranquility in the world, and for the salvation of all, let us pray. For all our elected officials, for our legislatures, and for the courts of this land, that they may pursue justice and peace, preserve the common good, and advance the welfare and dignity of all people, let us pray. For all who by their vocations are placed in harm's way on our behalf, let us pray. For the sick, that they may find wholeness in the healing power of the Holy Spirit, and for those who have died, that they may rest in peace and rise in glory, let us pray.
Yeah, you never cease to care for us and prepare the 